Dr. Laura Bruno, and she's talking today about the human animal bond, how animals make meaning in our lives. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is my first faculty lecture in terms of even attending. Um, I usually teach on uh, Wednesday evenings and actually my class is meeting right now without me. Um, so hopefully they've not gotten into any trouble. Um, but they're graduate students so I'm hoping that I can trust them a little bit more than maybe your average undergrad. Um, but I'm, I teach in the Department of Counselor Education. And for those of you who don't know, Counselor Education is a purely graduate program. And we take um, students in who um, have maybe psychology backgrounds or sociology. Um, some, I have actually have had a biologist change careers and be, end up deciding to become a counselor. And so we train them in terms of becoming mental health counselors and then school counselors. Um, and then we also have a new track um, for addiction counseling. So I um, end up teaching them for a few years. And then after we're done, they can go and um, do some clinical work in the field and get licensed as, as professional counselors or licensed school counselors in the community. So that's a little bit of, of what it is that I do. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the human-animal bond as it relates to counseling towards the end because that's really what my, my passion is with, with animals is infusing them into the counseling setting. However, I know that that might not be your interest. Um, so I'm going to try to um, backpedal and talk a little bit more generally about just humans and animals and why is it that we have this strong bond with each other? What, what is it about animals um, that brings out so much in us? Um, so I would be remiss without, um, uh-oh, Christy. It worked before. Is, that, is it just this pointer? Yeah, they, but I would have to, I have to present my co-presenter here. Um, this is Moose. Um, I'm thinking most of you got to meet him. This was actually uh, taken last spring on his first day of work. Um, so you could tell he was very excited about going. Um, and what Moose and I do is we are a registered um, pet partners team. Um, so he is not a service animal. Um, he has not been trained to uh, work with the blind or the deaf or do search and rescue or anything like that. He and I um, have had training um, in order to be able to help people um, in the community, such as nursing homes, um, hospitals, schools. That's actually where we're doing our work right now is at the elementary school. And then also I can take them into a private practice setting so I can use them one-on-one -on -one when I'm counseling if I choose to do so. Um, but right now I'm teaching full-time. Um, so that's what he does. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the differences of, of of the distinctions of, of the type of animal therapy that can be done. So I think he's going to go to sleep, um, <laughs> which is good. Um, when we were working with kids, um, we're doing a reading program at the elementary school where we go in one day a week and read, we read to struggling, struggling readers read to him. So I'm not really part of the process. So they're, they're ones who might be uh, maybe uh, shy or have low self-esteem. They really struggle. And so reading to a dog. Um, really helps open them up and they gain a lot of confidence. Um, and so unfortunately what Moose does is I haven't figured out how to, how to get him to not do this. He sleeps and farts the entire time <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that we're doing this. So uh, yeah, so I have to figure out how to keep him awake and to keep him from not farting throughout the, the hour or two hours we're there. But luckily the, the third graders think it's funny, you know, so, so that, that works out for, for our benefit. So, so he might start you know, passing gas over here, so please just ignore him. He's just being a dog. So uh, that's my moose, and he's uh, four years old, and he's a mixed breed. He's a part healer and part St. Bernard, um, or at least that's what they, they, tell, they tell me. I'm trying. Yay! Okay, so today's objective, to help explain this. We can feel it, but how did we get to this place of truly connecting with animals? So I have a good friend, uh, Dr. Jared Beaton, who teaches in earth science, and I always kid him that pretty much all he teaches about is dirt, you know, the earth sciences, because I don't understand a, a lot of the science, and so I just make fun of him. And so his counter to me is that I always talk, I just teach feelings, which is very accurate. Um, I teach a lot about feelings and how do people connect with other people. And so I'm going to be talking about feelings throughout this whole lecture, because that's, that's what I, I do. And if Jared was here, he'd be talking about dirt, I imagine. Um, so we're going to talk about feelings, but I'm also going to encourage you to talk about your own feelings because I wouldn't be a counselor educator if I didn't get you to self-explore a little bit. So I will look for hopefully some audience participation. 
So I'm just warning you that that's where we're going with all of this. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, and then at the end, I would also, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how this relates to the counseling profession and, um, and explain a little bit of that. So there's some pretty strong images up here, and I just want you to take a couple seconds to, to look at them and just try to feel perhaps what's going on in that photo. So this was taken at an evacuation center right after the tsunami back in 2011, so to provide some context. Um, and in the, the photo on the left, um, sleeping, holding, and on the right, um, there's a, an aftershock that was happening, and that's what she was doing. She was holding to actually comfort her dog. So to give you some more context. I'm wondering what's coming up for you all when you're looking at this. <coughs> what are some feelings that you're having? Sadness. Sadness. Thanks, James. Despair. Despair. Okay. So on one hand, there might be some strong negative emotion, but on the other hand, there could be maybe some strong positive emotion. So here's another one from similar type of um, background. I, I believe this is somebody um, who had just maybe been reuni reunited with a pet. And it's a little hard to see kind of his facial expression. But um, I would almost describe it as just anguish. Anguish in a lot of ways, but also incredible happiness. So even in the midst of horror and times of um, tragedy, people can find a lot of comfort in, in the place of animals. And that's actually one thing that um, animal therapy has been used for is disaster counseling, going to sites such as maybe aftermath of Katrina or aftermath of you know, some kind of large-scale disaster, Virginia Tech shootings, there were some do dogs who went there to help out. So, um, and I'm not sure how much it's used on the international scale yet, but nationally it's become, a, it's become very popular. So again, why do we love our animals? Why do we? You know, what, where does this come from? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. And I guess the, the thing that I would like to add is that once we understand the um, human-animal bond, we can put it to good use. Again, using it more into the profession that, that we have. Um, and I just want to give some background that I've always been an animal lover. Um, if you look at photos of me as a, as a young girl, I'm, I'm always holding an animal or showing a drawing of an animal. I mean, they've just been a huge part of my life. I will admit, I do not care for mosquitoes. <laughs> I will kill them. If I see one, flies, I'm also very irritated by. Um, spiders, insects, they kind of give me the creeps, but I'm okay with them. And actually, people do sometimes use um, uh, snakes and those types of things in animal therapy, so they can be used. Um, I might not be as inclined to use them just because of my own little phobia of, of them, all the legs, the legs get to me. Um, but no, for the most part, I really do love all animals. And so I have this incredibly strong bond. Um, and I actually did think about pursuing some kind of work with animals, and then I ended up going, going into counseling. Um, and then later on, I found out I can actually bridge the two of them together. And for that, that was ex really, really exciting for me. So I do want to just throw that out. But I guess I want to, curious um, to hear from you all, <coughs> what meaning do animals hold for you on a personal level? Please, yes. Well, I've been thinking about getting a bear dog, a okay. alien bear dog, and I was reading about it on the internet last night. And it said, this is not a dog for an inexperienced dog owner. Hmm. And it's a very powerful dog. Sure. And it's a very assertive dog. And I've had a large dog. It was a St. Bernard Cross mm -hmm. before. And just thinking, I don't have one anymore, but just thinking about getting another powerful dog like that um, that requires a lot of training and a lot of one-on-one -on -one every day to keep him in, you know, a good middle place and a good physical place, I noticed that it's quickening my my sense of life and calling on me to be a giver. Hmm. Interesting. And and making me feel kind of like somebody who who can run a mile or run ten miles, you know. It's kind of a sense of power. So it's maybe redefining who you are a it little seems bit. To be yeah. re, it, it seems to be quickening. My sure. sense of, of what I would rise to the occasion to give to a dog like that. 
interesting. Okay. So having a large, powerful dog like that, you might you have to look within your own life and look within your own um, desire. Maybe what why what is it about this large dog that might appeal to me? How is that going to maybe change me a bit in terms of what I have to do? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, an animal that we care for always makes demands on us. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that they tend to own us. <laughs> we think we own them, but I've noticed that it's kind of opposite sometimes. Mm -hmm. They certainly, yes. I can feel them asking me to feed them. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm kind. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What about anyone else? What meaning do animals hold for you? And some of you might not like animals, and that's fine. Feel free to, to share. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll tell you to leave, but that's okay. <laughs> Here's the part of the family. Part of the family, okay? I think they're fun and they make me laugh. Fun, make you laugh. Well, I'm from the Valley Humane League, and I remember Moose before he was your Yes, dog. I remember you, yeah. okay? Before he was your dog or mm -hmm. child. <laughs> dog. Well, child and now dog, now that I have a child. so oh, <laughs> Poor Moose. The last year has been kind of hard on him. But I'd like to just give you this poster. And maybe you can just uh, announce it to everybody here. Of course. Sure thing. Thank you. So, yeah, so I did get Moose at the Valley Humane League. I think that's the, the name of the organization. So, and we were very fortunate we found him because he did definitely become part of our family. Okay, so family, um, kind of joy. Yes? I would say uh, unconditional love and both trust. Okay. And how do you know that that's happening? How do you know that there's that unconditional love? Well, I don't see the manipulation in the receipt that I see in the two-legged, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. They're probably not going to lie to you, sure. you know, betray you, that type they're of thing. Corrupted. What was that? They're not corrupted. They're not corrupted. That's great. What about their room? I see now, I'm going to go, hey. I don't know. You haven't met my cat. No? <laughs> she, she's a little mean. She's a, she's a little mean. So, and she beats up on him constantly, so, which is pretty funny. So I'm thinking, you know, one of the common themes that I hear when I talk to people about, you know, what, what personal meetings do animals hold, I think this is such a great quote by Elliot from 1857. Animals are such agreeable friends, they ask no questions and they pass no criticism. You can always count on them. There's that sense of dependability, that sense of unconditional love. Um, and they, like friends, they can be fun. Um, they can make us happy. Um, so let's think a little bit about animals in our culture. And I could, this could be an entire presentation in and of itself in terms of how much are they part of our culture. So if you think of our language, um, we have buck teeth, we have somebody who's strong as an ox, we have somebody who's gentle as a lamb, um, someone who slies a, fo slies a fox. Anything else come, come to mind? Weasling politicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those weasels, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have large asked for their forgiveness when she is granted. What else do we have in our culture? Bird brain. Bird brain? Pigs. What was that? Pigs. Okay. But what about pigs? Like, how are they? Oh, you you are a pig. Okay. Okay. We also have a couple. You know, one swear word comes to mind that that's very popular as well. Um, so, in terms of our material uh, culture, we have teddy bears, piggy banks, turtleneck sweaters. Hot dogs, Mustangs, our car, and then um, a more current one, Red Bull, which I'm sure you, if you work here in the college, you probably see a lot of Red Bull being, being drunk throughout the day. Um, and if you look at our media, we have Mickey Mouse, we have Lassie, um, our leisure, we have the Chicago Bears. How many sports teams have an animal in it? What was that? The Grizzlies? Oh, I should have put that out there. I, I didn't even think about it. ASU Grizzlies. I thought maybe I could have a previous alum in here who would get angry, though, if I mentioned the Grizzlies. So, uh, The Easter Bunny, et cetera. I mean, there is not one part of our social world that is not touched by an animal, by some reference to animals. They are so ingrained um, in our daily life. Um, and the article that I pulled this from was actually written in 1979. And so when I read through it, because it gives you probably over 200 examples, I, I don't understand a lot of it <laughs> because I don't know what the references are um, to many because culture has changed um, in, the, in the past 20, 30 years. Um, so yeah, so it'd be real interesting to kind of revisit that and kind of see how much to, you know, that, that has changed. So let's also look at the research. What does some research tell us? This starts <laughs> early. Nine-month-old infants approached and touched and looked at a rabbit 
more than a female adult stranger, so another human, but a human they didn't know, um, and a wooden turtle that moved, made noise, and flashed light, so some kind of an interaction. So they were much more drawn to an animal than they were to a stranger human or some kind of an inanimate object that was designed to entice them. And I know that my uh, young son, who's uh, just turned one, cannot get enough of moose. He is all about moose, and luckily moose is incredibly gentle with him. I'm so grateful, because I was really worried that he wouldn't be, and then I'd have to make a really hard decision. Um, so, but luckily he's been really great. Um, so we'll see when he starts walking and climbing what happens then, but, yes? Well, I've always, well, she was a baby, um, noticed that babies, one-year-old, two-year-old, you know, like in a grocery store, they pick up on each other the same way they pick up on dogs. Hmm, okay. That a grown-up is going to sort of kiss another baby, mm -hmm. an animal, mm -hmm. so I don't know what that is. Yeah. So like in the same way when yeah, and, and you can't ask. So, you know, you, you don't know what it is, but we do know that this identification, this bond, starts very, very early. There's a lot of studies that are done on children. So, out of 300 um, people, boys and girls, between the ages of 3 and 13, almost 100% of them wanted pets. How come? A confidant, a friend, somebody to play with. You know, a partner in crime, if you will. Um, so yes, that's, it's great, because um, once my son starts getting older, Moose will be older, and he'll start to settle down, because he's a big dog. He's a really big dog, so I'm looking forward to the two of them playing and, and kind of having that, that bond that y you can't really replace, that I remember having with my own dog when I was a little girl. So when asked to list the 10 most important individuals in their lives, seven and 10-year-old children included two pets on their list. And I know when I used to counsel children, I would always have them draw their family on their first session. It would help me get an idea of what was going on at home. And they always included their pet in their drawing, always. And that was a huge, huge part of it. I have another one on here I want to make sure I, I add. So if you ask uh, five-year-old children, 42% of them, if you ask them, um, whom do you turn to when you're feeling sad, angry, happy, or wanting to share a secret? Almost half of them mentioned their pet. That, that's who they would turn to. So that's a big indication for me as a, as a counselor that pets or animals in, in counseling can be very useful. Um, two and six year old children interacted, a little scary here, with a tarantula. <laughs> this was a research study. A rabbit, a cockatiel, a dog, and two realistic stuffed toys. One was a bird and one was a dog. 80% of them never even looked at the stuffed animals. They didn't even pay attention to them. 74% touched the dog. 21% kissed the dog, and 67% talked to the bird. They didn't say what happened with the tarantula. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I purposely reread that just yesterday because I knew it might come up, and I did not find any information on it. So I don't know what happened with the tarantula, but that, that is uh, the information I have. So that tells us that, the, again, uh, animals are really powerful to children. So let's think about you know, adults now. Does this look like any of your family photos at home, perhaps? We definitely see where the dog is in yeah. compared to everyone else. Look at that poor kid in the back, you know? Not even in focus. So, but if we start looking at families, American families, 66% of the population have pets. Currently, there's about 500 million pets in the United States. And this is dogs, cats, birds, fish, and, and so on. 48% um, define pets as family members. 67% had photo of pet, 73 let pets sleep in bed, 65 buy Christmas present for their pets. I know I once spent $200 at Petco right before Christmas, and I couldn't believe I did that, but I did. 40% celebrated their pet's birthday. Um, 23 prepare special meals, and I love this one. 40% of married women say they get more emotional support from their pets than from their husbands. Is this ringing true for any of the women in this room? Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay. So how does this impact us? There have been a lot of studies. I'm not going to go through them all. But studies have shown that owning a pet, actually having a companion animal, increases your social interaction and your support lowers your blood pressure, increases your mental alertness, lowers your overall um, incidence of depression, and increases your overall, <coughs> overall well-being. Let's think about that first one, that social interaction. Why do you think that is? How would owning a pet help you interact more with people? 
<laughs> there you go. Particularly dog owners. And I know that I live right by uh, the river, the river walkway, and so I'm out with moose at least once a day. And I know almost everybody who lives in that area just because I know them by walking their dog. I don't know where they live, you know, but I know them and their dogs. And I'll sometimes be walking because my husband walks moose every morning. I'm not up that early. Um, he walks him every morning, and so I'll be walking sometimes, and people go, hi, moose. And they know him, but I don't know who they are, but he has met them. So um, it definitely has increased social interaction. Um, and that is a, also a big part of all of, the, all, all of the rest of us. The more support you have, the more contact you have with other human beings as well can also <coughs> increase all of this. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the blood pressure and kind of more of that medical stuff in a bit. But I want to pause. Any questions, comments so far while I get my bearings here? Yeah, Marty? Comment on, on the user question that you are there certain types that are more likely to be exposed to the And I'm going to uh, talk about that in a moment, the types of animals. But you mentioned fish. And there um, have been studies that have done that um, for, for um, people who are waiting oral surgery in a dentist office and that type of thing. Those that have fish tanks have actually had a better, um, better experience in terms of being prepared for the experience because it almost was a hypnotic effect. And um, in nursing homes and um, hospitals and that type of thing, there's something called the, the Eden effect. That's what they try to do. They, they try to bring in as much of the natural world because they have found that they've had a lot of great results, even with a fish. So it doesn't necessarily mean the cuddling, the touching, the stroking. Um, it can just even mean the, the, the watching, the movement, and kind of getting into just more of the natural world so that that is a possibility. Something alive. Mm -hmm. Just that connection, yes, and we're going to get into get into that. Um, so, but why? Why would this happen? You know, so that's that's what we're moving into. So this is a really great quote, and it kind of sums up a, a few things that I, I want to talk about. So through thousands of years of coevolution, cats and dogs have developed an emotional responsiveness to humans unparalleled in the animal kingdom. So this is what makes these two um, animals in particular different. Whether artifice or not, they seem to hang on our every word. They respond to our signals of sadness with a lick or a flop of a tail. They purr and rub against us with every appearance of total delight when we return home. They come to us with an unmistakably expressed desire for our company and make us feel as though someone cares. So this has been something in the making for a long time. Um, not to say that you know, people have had the same connections with dogs and cats at some point in our history. This has definitely developed. And this is a big difference why cats and dogs in particular have that oh, reaction in us that maybe a snake might not. Because snakes are still kind of that, we haven't figured out if they're a threat to us yet or not from an evolutionary standpoint. Does that make sense? Okay. Whereas um, I was driving home from Pagosa Springs this weekend over Wolf Creek Pass, I forgot to tell you this, and two um, black bear cubs ran across the pass. And it was luckily we were going up, so we were going so slow. Um, so it's not like we were in danger of hitting them. But it was the most adorable thing to, to watch them you know, running away. And so you know, normally I would think, oh, let's stop. But then I thought, no, mama bear is probably very close, and we don't want to come anywhere near her. So even though you might still have that reaction, there's still that, Ooh, but you still have to stay away from certain animals. And those of us who may have had and bad reactions with animals. For example, if somebody had been bit by a dog early in their life, they might not necessarily have that same oh response when they see an animal. So there's definitely something about kind of our history and how we've developed, not only just one-on-one -on -one with the animal, but as, as um, kind of through our history as, as, our, as our species. So, so that's a, a big deal. But another big part of this is that there's some kind of intentionality, particularly with cats and dogs. They, can, they, they interact with us, which is something that snakes don't really do. Now, those who might you know, really have that, that strong sense of, of, of a relationship with the reptiles or have had somebody for a long time, that might be different. But there's not as much of an interaction as much with um, perhaps with cats and dogs. And then also horses. Horses are also a, a huge part of animal therapy. 
So let's talk a little bit about how this bond um, originated. So if you look through you know, famous artwork and um, accounts throughout history, you'll see that there are references that there are references to animals um, throughout, throughout our history. So where, where did this bond come from? There's this fancy Latin term that's um, called, I don't even know if I can pronounce it. Anybody want to take a stab for me? Attentionis egans. Attentionis egans. And basically it's, it's, it's for some kind of attention seeking behavior. That's kind of what it, it talks about. But they don't want to use attention seeking because attention seeking can have a negative connotation to it. So that's why they're not using that term. But really what it is, it's our innate need for having positive interactions <coughs> as a prerequisite for a successful social interaction. So there's something about us wanting to have some kind of an interaction with somebody else, maybe even an animal, in order to, to feel um, good about ourselves. Um, our needs for nurturance, affiliation, and attachment have never, as far as I'm aware, been considered anything but rooted in the biology of our species. So somewhere inside of us, can't really, can't really pinpoint it, you can't do an operation and, and take that part <coughs> out of us, but somewhere inside of us there is this need for belonging. There's this need for attachment. There's this need for some kind of a relationship. And for some people, they get that from animals. That, that that can be the basis for that. Are we all with me? Great. Um, so the ones that really help, and this is what I've been saying, are interactions that are mutually beneficial, reciprocal, and typically form with those who are intelligent, require our care. Remember somebody said something about you have to take care of them? They almost own you rather than you own them. Um, and are friendly and have similar human traits. And it's pretty funny, we do end up picking animals that tend to look like us. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So. so there's something a little bit different between maybe a more domesticated animal, like a dog in particular, than maybe more of an exotic animal, like a zebra. You know, you might not have that same kind of interaction because you're not necessarily taking care of them in that same way. They don't have that dependence on you. So what is bond? What does it mean to be bonded with somebody? Anybody like to take a stab at it? Feel a part of you. Feel a part of you. Connection. What was that? Connection. A connection, thank you. Trust. Trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with animals, this bond <coughs> is very much essential to both. And that's the key difference between more of our pets versus more of exotic animals. Um, so the AVMA, um, the Veterinary Medical Association, defines the human-animal bond as a mutually beneficial relationship that is influenced by behaviors that are essential to the health and well-being of both. This might be why people don't have as much of an issue eating um, beef, pork, chicken, but you ask them to eat a dog, no, never, because there is that sense that I am taking care of this animal, they're almost like a child, versus maybe somebody who might um, just go to a grocery store. And I know that I've struggled with this over the years. I would love um, in many ways to become a vegetarian because of my strong love for animals. However, I just don't have that drive to necessarily go through it. I don't know what it is that stops me. For some reason in my mind, I'm able to make that distinction. And some people can't. For some people, they can eat animals. It just isn't a part of them. And for some people, shooting a dog, wouldn't even, they wouldn't even bat an eye. You know? so, so there's a huge <coughs> continuum there in terms of how we react to animals, particularly domesticated animals. Isn't that usually cultural too? Yes. I mean, you know, where mm -hmm. they eat a dog. Exactly. Um, you know, place, I think, you know, the whole pet phenomenon, you know, mm -hmm. is people who can already go to have extra. If you don't have extra, you don't have the same mm, That's a really great point. Did everyone hear that? No. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. If you live, we live in a society where we have a lot. You know, we, we might not necessarily, um, those of us who are fortunate enough, do not go hungry. And I think that's what you're referring to. Whereas um, people maybe in different, even in, in within our own culture or in maybe in different countries, um, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Um, people in other countries, they might not necessarily have what we have. So you, you take what you can get, and there might not be that distinction of excess. And competing for the food. Mm -hmm. That's true. That is true. Marty? Yeah, yeah, even in our culture, how many times have you seen 
someone in elbows uh, standing on the side of the road with a, a cardboard sign yep. that says help and so on. And yet, uh, yep. mm -hmm. And animals are very, very essential to the homeless population because of that companionship, that sense of family, that sense of some type of stability. So, so that definitely, definitely. <coughs> Anyone else have any comments, questions? Okay. So there's some kind of a, a reciprocity happening. And um, as I'll talk in a little bit, animals, some animals, get just as much from us as we do from them. Um, there have been um, some studies that found even with cattle and livestock that, um, and, and other domesticated, uh, and then domesticated animals, that those that are touched, that are stimulated in some way, are actually more immune to disease versus you know, an animal that doesn't have that kind of human interaction. So there definitely is a give and take relationship. There's, a, there's something that we also do to the animals. So let me just make sure I'm not missing anything here because there's a lot of information. So yeah, so the bond is definitely a two-way street. Um, and that definitely increases the more dependence there is on between the, the, the human and the animal. Yes? Uh, sometimes we see what can happen to dogs and cats if they don't experience human interaction at a young age. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what, what we see is that feral animals are very difficult, even very young ones are very difficult to turn around if they mm -hmm. haven't had that human interaction at the right stage of their life. Because mm -hmm. animals have developmental ages and stages just like humans. Yes. Beings. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a very important point. Thanks. So we're going to talk real briefly about these uh, six areas of how do bonds form. So how does this all start? And um, number one, caregiving. <laughs> as you nurture an animal, as you give a little bit of yourself to them in, in that mother type role, um, you develop that connection, okay? So they become your child, they become your baby, you take care of them, and that attachment is huge. Now there's a lot of controversy right now about, you know, do you let kids cry it out? Do you let them cry it out or do you respond to their every need? And as a new mother, that's something that I've had to decide. How do I stand on this? And research has said that we do need to respond to them, that if we consistently don't respond to them, they will not develop that attachment. And that is a huge part of it. So as um, you were saying that, yes, um, you know, between three to seven weeks of age for dogs and for cats, that is their prime time to attach to humans. And if they don't get it, they might not attach. And when we adopted Moose at age one, we went and saw Dr. Steffens, and he said, I just want you to know, you might have missed that ability to attach with him based on his age. You know, you can't, we can't know what his life was like before he came to your home. Luckily, that wasn't the case, and, we, were, and we, we took the risk. But that is the risk sometimes that you have when you try to have that relationship with an older animal. Um, and luckily, it, it didn't happen. So caregiving is really big. Um, another one is time. I don't know if anyone knows where this photo came from. Maybe some of you with a social psychology background. Henry Harlow, I think, is the, the, the researcher back, gosh, 50s, 60s? Long time ago. Awful research. I mean, nowadays, I don't think he would ever get it approved. Um, what he did is he um, was trying to decide how um, attachment happened. So he was taking young baby monkeys and putting them in cages, and some of them had wired um, um, representations of mothers, and some had cloth on them, and they would dispense food. And he found out that the monkeys tended to gravitate towards the cloth, ones more for comfort. And then the really sick thing that he did is he kept a lot of them in isolation, and some of them were kept in isolation, didn't have any contact with anybody for a year. And they found out that these monkeys were severely stunted. Um, rocking movements, um, they, they couldn't control their, their um, feces and that, I mean, they just, had, had, they lost it. Um, and so the sense of having time, of having that, that, that um, connection, particularly from a really early age for animals is very, very important, particularly um, some of more of the domesticated animals. So time um, is, is, is very, very important. So yes, I, I'm sorry to bring that up. It's such a, such a sickening 
Um, whenever I read anything about it, I just get, get really, really angry. Um, but time is definitely a big part of it. Um, similarities. As I said, we tend to pick those that look like us, and we tend to mimic what our animals do. Um, so, so there's definitely the sense of if you feel that the, per, that the animal can connect with you in some way on, on, a, on a deeper level, um, there's definitely the similarity. Um, it's the same idea that we tend to um, date people who look like us. You know, it's that same concept that we're attracted to things that are very familiar. Understanding. Um, if we feel that the, the animal can understand what we're going through, um, and, and, and know what, how we're feeling, know wh what, how we're um, feeling at, or thinking at the time, then we have a stronger bond, which is why there's certain animals that we do have more of a bond with. And that's why horses work out so well, because horses are so in tune with human experience. Um, they're amazing at picking up who is scared of them, who is angry, who is sad. Horses have an uncanny, uncanny way of detecting that. Who's and more so, for the what was that? Who's more Exactly. Yeah, they know who's confident. They can pick it up like that. And, you know, in a way, dogs and cats also know. I mean, cats know who doesn't like them because they go and sit right in their lap, right? <laughs> Just to prove a point, you know? So. Um, and then the, the, more, the, the more understanding you have, the stronger of bond that you'll have. So I'll make sure I'm not missing anything else. And then touch. Touch is very important as well. Um, and I wanted to try to include as many non-dog photos as I can, just, just to, to emphasize the point. That isn't just um, canines or, or felines. <coughs> um, but touch, when we are touched, any kind of stroking sensation, it doesn't have to be furry or soft, but any kind of touching sensation releases a hormone called um, oxytocin. Has anyone ever heard of oxytocin? Um, which is kind of a, an antidote to um, cortisol, which is a stress. So once we start to touch, then we start to feel better. I mean, that's what sex is. Sex releases tons of oxytocin. I mean, that's how we start to, to feel better, is, is through that contact. And so even just petting an animal, even for, I can't remember what the research is, but even for 15, 20 minutes, can have an amazing impact on our blood pressure, on, 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 our, on our body, and, and our uh, stress mechanisms. So touch is very important. And that's one of the key reasons why animals are so helpful in counseling, because as a counselor, I can't touch my client. I'm ethically bound to not have that interaction. I can't hug them. I can't touch their hand. I can't ha connect with them. Um, so animals in therapy can provide that sense of touch that I can't give, give to a client. Now, obviously, if a three-year-old you know, client wanted to give me a hug, I'm not going to you know, back away. But there, there's definitely boundaries, particularly with adults. And then finally, emotional situations. Um, when you have an emotional response to something, you tend to remember it, right? right? Like the, the, the monkeys in the cage and being isolated, that is a strong emotional response. So I remember that very well. It's something that I can't get out of my mind. And so um, that's why when you teach, you should use as many visuals as you possibly can because that's what's going to connect. People are going to forget you know, maybe the, the details of the, of the information, but they'll remember the, the big picture because they've connected with it in some way. So animals do bring about some strong emotional situations. And sometimes that's love. Um, being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, while loving someone deeply gives you courage. And I'm going to share kind of a sad story here of um, a researcher who wrote about animals in therapy and also told the story of having to put his dog to sleep. So he said, I recently held my beloved 14-year companion. It's a very long time. As the vet injected morphine into the veins of a critically ill dog, between the tears of sadness and of joy at such a long-term attachment, I held, I'm afraid I can't pronounce that, Hawaiian for rainbow, as her soul left her body and from my point of view went to doggy heaven, where a great celebration in her honor began. No dog was ever more loved, the vet gently exclaimed as she touched my, my arm draped around her now lifeless body that a moment earlier had housed the elusive breath of life. And no one has loved me more. I thought to myself as I carried um, her body back to the clinic for her cremation. So there's this huge amount of love that can exist between a human and an animal. And there really aren't a lot of words to, to describe what that is. <laughs> so what do you think this uh, reptile is saying? He has a flower in his mouth. One could joke around, hey, come, you know, come stroke me. I have a flower to give you. <laughs> um, but this is another key reason why we, we have this connection with animals. It's something called anthropomorphism. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, 
And this is when we think that animals are like humans, okay? <laughs> Which isn't true, but we think that they have human-like behavior. So just look at these two visuals. What do you think the one up on the left said? I'm, I'm so sorry I peed on the rug. I couldn't help myself. And the other one? You brought home a baby? Who are you? I'm so glad Moose didn't react that way when I brought my son home. But yeah, so we look at them and we think they're sad, they're angry. There's some kind of, a, a, of an emotion. When in fact, that's not true. That, that isn't true, that doesn't happen. Uh-oh, are we stuck on this one? There we go. <laughs> so what do you think this dog is probably feeling? Embarrassment. Embarrassment? Do you think he feels cool? Look at me, you know, I'm dressed up. Poor Moose, I put him up in a bumblebee costume every Halloween. You know, I, I, I subject my dog to the same torture that I'm sure many other people subject their animals. Okay, so we can think maybe he might be having fun, and we definitely are having fun with it, right? We think it's cute, we think it's funny, so we probably assume our dog thinks it is too, right? But if you notice, what is the key thing he's doing there? No, he's showing stress. He's showing stress. And there's certain signs in dogs particularly, and this is something I had to be trained in to recognize Moose's stress signs. I mean, if you look at Moose right now, he seems fine. But if he was pacing, um, you know, kind of shaking, licking is a huge sign, um, sweating, you would get to see if their um, paws have any kind of sweat on them. Um, so there's very, very specific stress signals that your animals, once you get to know them, will exhibit. And this licking is very, very common. That's a classic, I'm starting to. Now growling, hack, you know, like snarling, that's extreme. I mean, that, that's even more than stress, that's aggression. Um, and that's when you know that you went too far. Um, <laughs> definitely you went too far. So yes, yeah, so there's definitely um, some signals. However, you know, if, if, if you aren't trained to necessarily recognize it in, in a, an animal, you might miss it. You know, they're, they're very, they start off very subtly. Because um, what an animal is trying to tell you is that they don't like, they don't like conflict, especially dogs. So they, you know, if, if, like for example, the dog in this photo, you know, he's not sad. He's just responding to your angry face. But he doesn't know what it is. He just knows that something's up. Something's wrong. You know? So it's not that he's sad. He's just try he's trying to cower. He's trying to say, OK, I know something's going on here, and I don't want to fight with you. So I'm going to back away. It's kind of a predator, you know, a prey type response. Um, and so that's, that's really what's happening here. OK, so um, I just want to talk real briefly about um, animals and psychotherapy, which is um, the work that I end up doing. Just want to make sure there's nothing else. Um, and I guess one thing that I want to mention is anthropomorphism is not a bad thing. And in fact, in counseling, it's actually what really helps us connect with our animals. So if I'm working with um, a child, and let's say, you know, Moose was to back away and kind of be upset because maybe the child took away a toy or something. So there's some kind of an interaction. Then I, and then the child said, oh, well, Moose doesn't like me anymore. He doesn't want to be with me anymore. So they're kind of projecting these human-like behaviors, these human-like ideas. Then I can say, huh, what makes you think that about Moose? You know, and, you know, and, and what do you think Moose might be feeling right now? So then you can start to talk about the animal in a human-like way to kind of bring about those conversations. So it actually is a very good thing in the counseling environment, but in the general sense, it can sometimes get us into trouble of thinking our animals are more human than they are. So um, there's really a couple different ways you can use animals um, in therapy. Um, there's uh, trained volunteers who don't have any background in counseling, psychology, social work, nothing like that. Um, but they just love animals and they want to help people. So these are people who will go to nursing homes and hospitals and visit with people who are sick or um, um, ill or you know, elderly or something like that. Um, and to just kind of give them that companionship. So that's something that Moose and I can do. Um, but then there's also animal-assisted therapy where you're actually using the dog or the cat or the horse or the guinea pig or whatever animal it is to bring about something. Physical therapists use this to help with movement. Um, so physical therapists would use animals a lot. Um, 
And then also psychotherapists, um, such as myself, would use them in order to help people talk about feelings. And this, this, is, a, this is usually what I present on. So I could talk about this for a couple hours, but um, I won't, um, especially since we're coming close to the end of time. But that's what animal-assisted therapy is. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why this works. Not going to get into a lot of detail, um, but animals can sometimes um, kind of build the bridge between a client and a counselor, particularly children. They're scared to come to meet the stranger who they don't know. They're also going through a pretty tough time in their lives if they're going to counseling. And so they'll go, hey, this person has a dog with them. They, can, they have to be nice. They have to be friendly. So it kind of builds this buffer between the, the, the client and the therapist. Um, animals can be symbols and metaphors. I won't get into a lot of that theory, but um, we can use animals to describe how we might be feeling. Um, Animals can de-arouse. So if you're working with somebody who has a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic, animals, just touching them, being around them, can help make them feel better. Um, and then we can attach to them. We can build on that attachment. And animals are really used a lot with um, kids in juvenile detention centers. That's a big area. Because what animals do is they really help to foster that empathy. Um, so sometimes these are kids who, before they came into a program that worked with animals, they didn't care about people. They didn't have that sense of, because they didn't really love themselves. They didn't have that sense of self. Um, and so by having this connection with an animal, they're able to kind of start to have greater empathy for people in general. Um, animals can be a great source of support, and animals can be a good instrument of learning. So if you're, like for example, if you're teaching a dog a trick, um, you might get very frustrated with them. And so then you learn how the dog responds to your frustration. Well, then you can take that same learning experience and say, well, when you interact with a human that way and they get frustrated with you, you know, or you get frustrated with a human, what is that, that sense of learning? So animals can kind of be, um, can be used for, for learning about how to handle relationships differently. So again, I could talk about this for a long time, but I just want to give you a quick snapshot. And I really love this quote, so I have to um, share it with you, particularly about dogs. Um, and dogs are probably the most commonly used for animal-assisted therapy for a reason. Um, dogs freely share and give their love without prejudice and question, kind of different than cats. Cats are a little bit more fickle that way. Mm -hmm. They don't care if you are old or young, sick in body, or what you look like. They don't let us feel different. They don't care about our color, our speech, or if we are rich or poor, or where we come from. We benefit from their inherent kindness. Our presence is all that matters to a dog. So that's really at the core as to why these animals in particular work really, really great in the therapy environment. They are completely um, non-judgmental. That unconditional love is a big part of it. And one of the very cool things that's happening, um, and, and out of the uh, Michael Vick dogs that were used, um, I can't remember what the number were, but many of them have become therapy dogs. Um, and there's this huge, I don't know where it came from, but everyone doesn't like pit bulls. <laughs> you know, there's this fear of them, kind of the scare. But pit bulls actually are, make wonderful therapy dogs once they're able to have that bond established. So even an animal that has been subjected to horror and terror, like um, these dogs were, are able to overcome. And so the work that they do in therapy can have an amazing impact on them. Now there is a moral basis for animal-assisted therapy, and one of them in particularly is using um, what's called dolphin-assisted therapy. Now, I would love to do dolphin-assisted therapy. That sounds like a magical um, job, you know, just to swim with the dolphins all day and help them make people feel better. But there actually is um, kind of a, a controversy against using exotic animals because they don't have that same need for interaction and love as, let's say, a dog or a cat does. So there definitely is kind of a backlash in the community about using certain types of animals um, versus you know, an animal such as a dog. And again, the, the key part of all animal assisted therapy is the relationship. Um, you know, they talk about you know, youth in juvenile detention centers, punishments, they don't change people. So um, my, one of my colleagues who I present with and who lives in Michigan, um, she runs a program where she pairs up abandoned dogs with essentially abandoned kids who are in juvenile detention centers. And they train the dogs so they can become adoptable. And she has had amazing success for some of these kids who have had, this is their last chance. This is their last resort. And there's a lot of uh, places called green care where they take um, kids and they put them in um, environments where they're responsible for plants and animals and, and things like that. And, and they've had amazing success. So this relationship can actually change people. 
And I'm just going to leave you with um, this uh, couple, two, two last slides here. Um, this is one theory, and you can agree with it or not. Um, one theory is that as a society, we have lost our opportunity for healthy interaction. Um, because of the fact that many people are choosing to live alone, not get married. Many people are choosing not to have children. Families are compartmentalized. For example, my husband and I and my son are here alone. We don't have any other family. I work for the university. Um, all of our family is in different states, so we're very much alone. We don't have that sense of um, family connection. Um, parents tend to work outside the home and work long schedules. Sometimes they're not home a lot. You know, that you know, it's classic two-person income. Um, most kids nowadays are born in hospitals. They go to daycare right away. Um, they go to school. And then when they get home, they just must watch TV and listen to music. They don't necessarily, or on the computer, they don't necessarily have that same human interaction that we once had. So because of this, um, some theorists think that we have become unhealthy as a society. We actually have more stress in our lives because we're not connection, connected to nature, which would include animals. So that's one theory. And I think it's probably a little bit more involved than that, of course. But this idea of technology and industry has definitely changed our connection. Um, so um, these people would say that we need to really re rediscover, and we have been doing this, and I think this is a big push, especially with the green movement that's happening, that we have discovered that a close relationship to nature is vital to just our entire planet. It's a very important. And in particular, a relationship with animals will help fulfill this need that we have not only to nurture, but also to be nurtured. That's somehow along the way that we, we need to reclaim that. So as somebody who, who tries to um, help people feel better um, and have less stress in their lives, animals, I think, are just a natural, logical conclusion for the type of work I do. And I think that they could be very helpful you know, in other work which is why I'm really glad that Moose and I have the time to go to the elementary school and help with some of these readers. I mean, we're only gonna maybe meet with them an hour a week, you know, and each of them maybe only 15, 20 minutes at a time um, because he has regulations of how long he can work and that type of thing. Um, but, you know, we have the potential to really, you know, have a close relationship with the child and through that relationship for them to feel that they are nurturing him and that they feel that he's nurturing them in some way and that can be very powerful and might be able to, to make some small change that can lead to some bigger ones. So that is all I have. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'll feel free to take them now.